What advice do you have for relatively new programmers who are trying to ditch the OOP mindset and move on to things like data-oriented design and compression-oriented design? Um, so the advice that I would have depends on the person. So if you are somebody who learned to program and then learned object-oriented programming and it messed you up, then what I would say is just go back to the old way you programmed and start again from there. That's what I did. And it works really well. Um, and just focus on sort of programming the old school way where you just sat down and tried to get something to work and then add on to that the compression oriented steps where you go like, oh, okay, uh, now I'm going to pull some stuff out and now I'm going to try and make some things that like, you know, uh, are, are repeatable uh, things that I see myself doing often. I'm going to make repeatable pieces out of those, right? But if you're somebody who never learned how to program on their own and was taught OOP first, uh, then I'm afraid I don't know, since I've never been in that position myself, I don't know what the right thing to say is. Uh, I think what I would say is try to put the notion of the programming language out of your brain and try to think about the computer. What does the computer need to do to solve the problem that you have, right? What are the literal steps that the CPU must do to solve the problem? Write that as simply as possible. That is the foundation of coding. And everything that is structural language-wise that builds up should build up from that and not lose sight of that, right? Um, and so that's just something that people who learn to program by themselves without anyone ever telling them about object-oriented programming, uh, that's what they naturally did. Because when you naturally sit down and try to learn to program and you're just kind of like hacking around on a machine and just kind of poking at it, you always are coming from that mindset when you were learning. You were like, oh, I want the computer to like put a red dot here. How do I do that? And that's what you were thinking. But in your brain, you weren't thinking like, oh, do I need to like abstract the concept of a screen and red, should red be an object that, oh, what is this, the pixel an object or is it a group of objects? Is there a container? Do I have to ask a factory to get me a color and that color is red? You know, like all of those things just weren't in your head. So you learned how to program the right way first. And then what happened is when you started getting up into things where your programs were pretty big, and you were like, I need ways to manage this. Then you like kind of found OOP or something and it kind of ruined everything, right? And so what you want to do is just try to get up to that point right before the OOP ruining, throw away the OOP and realize that that first part was all correct. You don't need to rethink it. You actually were doing exactly the right thing. The only thing that you need to do is change the way you do your higher level organization. Don't think about OOP. Instead, just think about how can we reuse little chunks of this code, right? And when you start thinking about that, you just naturally pull out the pieces that are reusable and those pieces then can have pieces that are pulled out that are reusable, right? And again, you just compress, 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 right? And it's not like it's, it's magic. You can't just do it. You have to like practice that too and learn all of the different ways you can try to compress things. Um, but that is the right way to do it. And then that way, you don't have to think about objects. You don't have to think about those sorts of things or, or sort of these really kind of uh, extraneous concepts that really don't have that much to do with programming. And instead, you'll see that the closely related forms, uh, the parts of OOP that worked at all, uh, which are not many, but the parts that did, will naturally arise. You don't have to plan for them. You don't have to plan for objects anymore. Objects will naturally appear because they are the pieces that as they got compressed, they were the thing that in sort of encapsulated the data that this thing needed to work, right? And so you can even arrive at the same, like basically the same program even, sometimes uh, from an object-oriented mindset and a compression-oriented mindset. The difference is the compression-oriented mindset took a ton of the work out of it, right? Uh, but most of the time you end up in very different places. Uh, but that's good because usually the oop place is a bad place. Um, and the cop place is a good place, right? Uh, but yeah, and so, and so that's the thing. And again, I want to emphasize that like uh, object-oriented programming, the problem with it is not the concept that there could be an object, right? 
The problem with it is the fact that you're orienting your programming. It's exactly what it says, object-oriented programming. It's the object-oriented, the whole word, that's the problem, right? An object may not be a problem. Like, it's not a problem if an object suddenly appears in your code, like, oh my god, I gotta get rid of this object. This is a disaster, right? Because uh, data gets bundled all the time, right? That's, a, you know, that was before object-oriented programming as a concept ever occurred, data got bundled. And there are algorithms which operate on the data, and you could choose to link those two things together. You could do all sorts of things, right? And so the problem with object-oriented programming is the fact that you are orienting the thinking around the objects, not the functions. That's the problem, right? So it's the orientation that's bad about it, not whether you end up with an object. And that's a really important distinction to understand um, because it's, uh, I don't want people to get in this habit of thinking that, oh, if I ended up with a bundle of data, somehow that was bad, because that's not bad. Data does get bundled together. It, it's a way of reducing the number of things that you have to talk about in a particular piece of code, right? Um, and so where the problems start to come in is all this, the sort of object orientation start where you start to say like, oh, things have to be objects which are always encapsulated and they have private member functions, which are the only things, not private member, member functions that can operate on their private data, which are the, the only things that are allowed to do that. And that's important. Like all of that stuff is actually not important. That's like bad ideas, right? Um, and so you want to get rid of those, uh, but you don't want to, um, necessarily get rid of the concept that you might have bundles of data and there's functions that kind of go along with those in, in, the, in a sort of a way that you maybe say, okay, I'm going to sort of uh, put this aside as a library or something like that, right? Because C libraries still exist and, you know, the C library is not object oriented by any stretch of the imagination, but it has something like a time structure that has day, month, and year, and it has some functions that operate on that, right? And the difference is that the functions are primal and they can operate across many different types of things. They don't have any particular adherence to any sort of like, oh, I'm a friend of this, or I can only access the private of this, or oh, we've got to pass messages around, or any of this sort of things, right? Um, they just uh, have certain bundles that they do use to talk about, and those bundles uh, are units of information that we found to be convenient rather than having to pass everything in and everything out all the time, right? Uh, and so hopefully that gives a little bit of perspective on how those sorts of things shake out. Uh, and what is and is not important in the various models.